This is video number three in our series about presbyopia. In this video, we focus on surgical treatments. Welcome back to presbyopia, the need for reading glasses that happens to all of us sometime after age 40. Our presbyopia series has three parts. In video number one, we started by explaining the mechanism for close focus and how that declines with time. Most of the problem comes from progressive hardening of the natural lens in the eye. The traditional remedy has been to use glasses or contact lenses. Over-the-counter, non-prescription reading glasses are inexpensive and available just about everywhere. But in recent years, there's been a lot of effort to find alternatives to glasses. In video two, we covered eye drops. The first version has just been approved by the FDA and more are in trials. In this video, we explore the various surgical options, some of which are already in use. They involve the cornea, the sclera, and the lens. This is our plan for this video. Before we launch into the surgical options, we should review what we are trying to do with presbyopia treatment. In our visual world, we need to be able to see distance, intermediate, and near. The ideal presbyopia treatment would give you all three distances, but that is not such an easy goal. First and simplest, for two distances, there are bifocal options in glasses and contact lenses. For all three distances, there are trifocals and progressive lenses. Another approach is called monovision the term for having a different correction in each eye. With contacts, it would be a single vision lens in each eye, usually setting the dominant eye for distance and the non-dominant eye for reading. Surprisingly, people seem to adapt to this difference fairly well. It does not address intermediate range and there is some reduction in depth perception. I mention this not because it is ideal treatment, but because of its simplicity. It is a common part of a number of treatment strategies like LASIK in one eye or choosing lens implants. Otherwise, the ideal is to address all three distances. One last comment before we proceed. Consider, this is different from other eye surgeries like cataract surgery, where you are starting with impaired vision and trying to improve it. Refractive surgery involves taking the risk of operating on an otherwise healthy eye to get rid of the annoyance of glasses. Keep that in mind as we go through the various technologies. We start our surgery coverage with procedures involving the cornea. There are three procedures, LASIK, corneal inlays, and corneal reshaping using heat. Beginning with LASIK, people usually think about LASIK as used to correct myopia and small amounts of hyperopia, but it is also being used for presbyopia. In the first video, we talked about contact lenses correcting presbyopia by using either a single vision lens as monovision or a multifocal contact. One way to think about LASIK surgery is you can aim to recreate in the cornea what you can do with a contact lens, monovision or multifocal. With multifocal LASIK, one version has distance in the center with reading around the edge, the other has reading in the center with distance around the edge. Here is a quick review of how LASIK works, using a myopic eye as an example. The cornea in profile view, in myopia, the cornea is too steeply curved for the focal length of the eye, so the aim is to reduce power by making the cornea flatter. First step, a surface flap is created with either a mechanical device or a laser. Then the excimer laser goes to work. A small flying laser spot moves rapidly around the surface of the cornea, each pulse evaporating a small amount of tissue at a time. In this case, flattening the cornea to reduce the amount of myopia. When finished, 
the flap is replaced. Which brings us to what the profiles look like for presbyopic LASIK options. For LASIK to create monovision, it means making the central cornea steeper, creating myopia on purpose. To achieve a multifocal result, the cornea has to have two contours, one for distance and one for reading. For central distance, the center is relatively flatter, matching the distance correction, and the periphery is steeper for near focus. This requires more tissue removal, particularly in myopes. For central near, the center is relatively steeper and the periphery is flatter. On one hand, this is considered more physiologic because the pupil constricts with reading. On the other hand, you might expect this results in some decrease in distance vision. It is important to note that this requires less tissue removal and is currently the more commonly performed procedure. These are the various treatment zones and the modalities for each. We will pick one as an example, the AMO VizX in the central near group. This study is from Canada, published in 2011. They treated 66 eyes that were both hyperopic and presbyopic, using a blended approach to address both problems. Note how steeply curved the central contour is to create central near focus. First question, how does this affect distance vision? This is change in distance vision at six months after treatment. Just over 60% had no loss in distance vision, 10% lost two lines. The worst distance vision outcome was 2025 minus three. Or, looking at it in terms of refractive error, the average beginning refraction was near plus two diopters. The average ending refraction was within a half a diopter of emetropia. The near vision result? Over 80% had a gain of one or more lines. Almost 50% gained three lines or more. At 12 months, overall vision results were good at both distance and near. For the patients, that meant reduced use of glasses for both distance and near. That was just one example of several modalities. If you want to go further, this is a recent comprehensive review Including, including studies done on all of the treatment modalities. For the next strategy, we move to a different kind of corneal surgery. In this case, implanting a device within the cornea itself. Besides using a laser to evaporate tissue, as with LASIK, it can also be used to create a pocket in the cornea. In this procedure, this is usually done about mid-depth. Into this pocket, they place a device, disc-shaped, small in size, made of a biocompatible material. We present three different models, each using a different refractive strategy. First example is the camera in inlay. It is a flat, opaque disc, just under four millimeters in diameter, with a central hole of 1.6 millimeters. Within the disc are thousands of micro holes to allow diffusion of molecules within the cornea. The way this improves vision is by the pinhole effect. In video two, we discussed that a small aperture means less confusing light rays, resulting in a sharper image on the retina. It also results in greater depth of field. Two notes here. First, the camera inlay is placed in only one eye, the non-dominant eye, making it a version of monovision. Second, this requires uncorrected distance vision of near emetropia. How well does this work? One way to answer that is with the trial results submitted to the FDA. The FDA asked for the following criteria of success. Primary, 75% of eyes being able to see at near equal to 2040 or better without correction. Secondary, subjective improvement as measured by a questionnaire developed by the company. In a trial of 508 subjects, over 80% reached the 2040 level of near vision. 
The questionnaire was not validated, so it wasn't used. Adverse events of various kinds occurred in just over one-third of the eyes by three years out. Six patients required recentration of the implant. Five had additional refractive surgery like LASIK. Forty-four patients, just under 9%, required removal of the inlay. One of the reasons for removal, by far the biggest reason, was related to vision, particularly hyperopic refractive shift. If you want to see the details, the link at the bottom gives you the FDA summary report. As a conclusion, the reviewers found visual improvement was enough to outweigh the risks and approved the device in 2015. A different way to answer the question about vision improvement comes from another study from about the same time. Regarding near vision, 77% reached the 2040 level at three months, but that declined to 63% by six months post-op. In terms of patient satisfaction, 60% were at least somewhat satisfied. In terms of dependence on glasses, 42% were not dependent or rarely dependent on glasses. An additional 22% were sometimes dependent, which leaves us with the question, how much risk for how much vision improvement? Another corneal inlay, the raindrop inlay, is a lens-shaped disc, two millimeters in diameter. Its convex lens shape aims to steepen the center of the cornea, thus creating plus power. Unfortunately, the inlay caused clouding of the cornea and was recalled by the FDA in 2018. Inlay number three, the FlexiView implant, is a disc a little over three millimeters in diameter with a hole in the center. The peripheral part of the implant is an optical zone that creates plus focusing power. It didn't finish FDA trials and was withdrawn from development in 2019. There are new designs. Published just this year is a proposed lens design that uses diffractive optics to create a multifocal inlay. There is another procedure that aims to reshape the cornea by a process called conductive keratoplasty, or CK. The ring of orange spots represents areas treated by heat, which causes the collagen to shrink and thus reshapes the cornea. How this is done? A ring is marked on the cornea outside the visual area. The CK probe uses radio frequency energy directed through the tip to heat a small area of cornea, causing the collagen to shrink. Treated areas are spaced evenly around the ring. Additional rings of spots can be added to increase the effect. The result of shrinking the peripheral collagen is to increase the curvature of the central cornea, adding plus reading power. Unfortunately, the effect fades with time, and it is rarely used now. For the next set of surgical options, we move to the inside of the eye. In this case, we are looking at replacing the natural lens with an artificial one or adding a new lens. The technology to remove the lens and replace it with the technological marvel that is the lens implant has been refined into a high art in cataract surgery. Our goal here is not to provide a detailed discussion of lens implants but to give you a summary of the concepts. Lens implants are covered in detail in a separate video. Regarding the natural lens, it has different layers. Important for us is the outer skin layer called the capsule. At surgery, you want to remove the substance of the lens, but preserve the capsule in place as an envelope to hold the implant. Here is the lens implant sitting nicely within the capsule. This is what we aim for at cataract surgery, a good result all by itself. Now, consider that the ciliary body is still functioning and is still attached to the capsule. Maybe it could control the focus of the lens. A really nice concept, but a big challenge to execute. Looking at the lens implant, the center is the optical part that focuses light. 
The two arms are called haptics. They keep the lens centered in position in the capsule. In addition to the surgery, there's another major question. How do you construct the implant to address daily visual needs? In general, there are three categories of lens implants, single power, multifocal, and flexible. We will discuss their general properties. First and simplest, the single power lens implant with one focal distance. It gives a high level of image quality, good performance in low light, and is the least expensive. A single power lens can be deployed in different ways. Years ago in cataract surgery, we only had single vision lenses. Usually we put distance lenses in both eyes, meaning glasses were needed to see up close. One notable exception was people who were myopic before cataract surgery. They often preferred to end up myopic afterwards so they could still read without glasses, and they would wear glasses for distance and driving. Another option is monovision. Typically, the dominant eye is set for distance, and the other eye is set for near. If people liked this with contacts, they could do it with lens implants. More recently, there's another option, a monofocal lens for distance in the dominant eye and a multifocal lens in the non-dominant eye for improved range. These options all worked reasonably well, but the drive for independence from glasses led to change in strategy. The next lens type is a multifocal lens. Early versions had two focal distances, but with a difference. One had its focus set at far and near, the other had far and intermediate. Because neither proved to be fully satisfactory, it became an option to use one of each type. Newer lenses aim to improve functionality at all three distances. The trifocal lens divides light into three different focal points, whereas an extended depth of focus lens, EDOF for short, aims to extend the depth of focus to a broader range. Both work well, with the trifocal having some advantage at near, EDOF, less visual distractions. But multifocal lenses have compromises. There is an initial period of adaptation. Because you are trying to focus multiple images simultaneously, the image quality is less. Night vision is more likely to have issues with glare and halos, and may be generally reduced. Last are the lenses that attempt flexibility. There are several design options. This is the only one approved in the US. These are motivated by the idea that even late in presbyopia, the ciliary body is still able to contract. So, for a lens in the capsule, it could respond by changing its position and thus its point of focus. The result? Measurements show some flexibility early on but unfortunately, by one to two years out, there is minimal movement, which is usually attributed to the capsule becoming scarred and stiff. With the single vision optics, this lens still remains, retains the advantage of good image quality and night vision. Choosing an implant to go with lens replacement surgery is essentially the same as with cataract surgery, except you're not replacing a cloudy lens, Rather, the purpose of this surgery is to regain the ability to see up close without compromising distance vision. While the lens implants are not perfect, the results are pretty good and continually improving. Now, we have talked about the lenses in general concepts. There is significantly more to this discussion covered in the video on lens implants. We look at something called a defocus curve to show how well each lens performs at different distances. And on the practical side, what is the chance of reduced need for glasses? And what is the chance of unwanted visual phenomena like glare and halos? Again, this is covered in the separate video on lens implants. Lens implant options also include an implantable phacic lens. Phacic means your natural lens is still in place, so the implant is an additional lens inside the eye. Functionally, it acts like a contact lens, except 
being inside the eye means no maintenance. This particular implant is positioned between the iris and the lens. Phacic IOLs were originally used for myopia correction, which has some history we will not cover here. This is an EDOF version for presbyopia that is in development. A reference from the European trial is there. It is not yet approved in the U.S. The third and last target is the sclera. The idea of surgical intervention in the sclera has been around for a while. There are two approaches, incisions in the sclera and implants in the sclera. Previous attempts with either of these methods have not been successful. Here we will look at a couple of attempts to revisit these methods. The first proposal is based on the idea that it is not just the lens that is losing flexibility with age. Changes also occur in the sclera, choroid, ciliary body, etc which all act to restrict movements normally involved in accommodation. This theory is called visiodynamics. It is not related to the Shakar theory we'll talk about next. Proponents of this theory have developed a surgical approach, creating micropores in the sclera in three zones overlying the ciliary muscle in an attempt to restore useful tissue flexibility. This surgery is called sclerolaser anterior ciliary excision, or laser ACE, and also goes by the name laser scleral microporation, or LSM. Here is what the procedure looks like. For the detail-oriented, surgeries on the sclera begin by opening up the conjunctiva in order to access the sclera. Once exposed, a guide marker is placed in an oblique quadrant. The oblique orientation avoids impinging on the insertions of the eye muscles, which are in the horizontal and vertical meridians. They carry a significant part of the vascular supply to the front of the eye. A laser is used to ablate a series of nearly full thickness spots at 85 to 90 percent of scleral depth. Here the gold spots represent the first three treatment spots, then the full nine spots for this sector. A similar matrix is created in all four quadrants, followed by application of a proprietary collagen compound, thereby attempting to restore flexibility to the process of accommodation. In 2017, they published a series involving 52 eyes of 26 patients. We won't go into all the details except to note they started out near emetropia. This shows vision results over time for individual eyes, divided into near, intermediate, and distance, and further divided into uncorrected and distance corrected. We skip ahead to the binocular results because that is how most of us function. Near vision, the green lines at the top, showed modest improvement from 2032 to 2025, which was statistically significant. Intermediate improved, but not to a significant level. Distance vision did not change. For the patient's viewpoint, they did a multi-part patient satisfaction survey. Overall satisfaction with vision before the procedure started with a rating of minus one. After the procedure, it improved into positive territory, plus 0.33. The survey asked a number of specific questions about challenges in daily activities. I have rearranged the order. There was little impact on distance activities. The noticeable impact was on near activities, like doing handwork and reading the paper which paralleled the overall satisfaction rating. There is an additional trial currently underway in the Philippines with no results yet posted. This procedure has not yet received FDA approval. One additional note. This procedure is supposed to work by increasing the flexibility of the sclera. It does not address hardening of the lens. Its proposed use is in the early stage of presbyopia 
and before lens opacity becomes significant. Once cataract has developed, then cataract surgery is the answer. Another theory of presbyopia is related to expansion of the lens with time, which may reduce tension on the zonules. This is the Shakar theory discussed further in video number one. One strategy for addressing this issue is to expand the sclera in the front part of the eye in an effort to restore tension to the zonules. This proposed treatment is to use scleral inserts to expand the sclera. I'm not sure about the proposed geometry. Nevertheless, we will present a current example. This insert, designed by visibility, is shown at the upper right. It comes in two pieces that I'm showing together in the finished unit. Surgery starts with a mechanical device to create a standard sized tunnel to medium depth in the sclera. A special inserter is then used to slide the insert through the tunnel with the second part securing it in place. All told, four implants are placed in the oblique quadrants. I'm showing them in position here without the scleral tunnels. As a technical note, immediately following the surgery, they do formal pupil reaction testing to be sure blood supply to the front of the eye is not compromised. For results of the FDA trial, the reference at the bottom gives you a full report, including the history of product development. The vision results showed improvement, but statistically they were just below the required confidence interval. Also, Adverse events were a problem. A little over a third of treated eyes had some form of adverse event, most of which were relatively mild surface problems. But a significant portion were in the category of, quote, clinical concern, including impaired blood supply and perforation of the sclera. Of the 708 eyes in this trial, 27 required removal of the implants. In November of 2020, the FDA Advisory Committee reviewed the results and they felt the risks outweighed the benefits and rejected the application. And we come to the end of Video 3, Surgical Procedures for Presbyopia. We started with procedures on the cornea, like LASIK and inlays, then intraocular lens implants, and finally, procedures on the sclera, like incisions and implants. In the other videos in this series, video one is about how presbyopia happens in treatment with glasses. Video two is about pharmacologic methods, meaning use of eye drops to help with reading. There is a separate video that covers intraocular lens implants in detail.